Welcome to another episode of Get Wisdom. I'm Brian Kelly, along with Get Wisdom founder and director, Carl Mollison. This week, uh, we're going to uh, look at something that both Carl and I are very familiar with as we live in those environments. We're going to get creator's perspective on life in suburbia. A little bit different. Yeah, this might seem very ordinary and mundane, a kind of prosaic topic and rather obvious to many people. But even I was surprised that some of the information that came forward from Creator of All It Is, when we asked some simple, straightforward questions, comparing and contrasting lifestyles, and some interesting phenomena that uh, we'll be sharing with you along the way here, that shows us that the world and the universe is more exotic in many ways and more <laughs> surprising and wondrous. Yes, than we typically imagine. Most of what? most of it, of course, we take for granted. You know, yes. the miracle of life and the the huge abundance of many many differing creatures that are just amazing in the way they're put together and what they can do and all that. Yes. Well, we got a lot to get into, Carl. So I guess we should get started right away. Uh, all right. So first question is. Levittown, New York, is widely recognized as the birthplace of modern American suburbia. Levittown was the birthplace of truly planned communities where every detail from roads and streets, sewers, property lines, and even schools, churches, and shopping is all pre-planned before the first shovel full of soil is turned. At its peak, a new home was being built every 16 minutes. Mostly unskilled labor was used, and each worker was trained to do one highly specific job that they applied house to house to house. What was the inspiration involved in this development that transformed American and eventually global living for millions of people? All right, and this is what Creator told us as I channeled from that source. As strange as it may seem, this was largely divine inspiration. The motive and agenda of the interlopers has always been to concentrate humans into dense, close-living populations. This is for purposes of power and control and ease of manipulation, to keep an eye on them and to involve them in large groups with various manipulations and surreptitious influencing of their thoughts and beliefs, as well as activities. The idea of suburbia was a divine response to this siren call to attract people from rural settings with the shining glitter of the modern bustling metropolis and give them something in between, where they may be close to the action of the city center, but still have some breathing room, with the housing spread out a bit with individual family dwellings and not living spaces stacked on top of one another, reaching into the sky, but resulting in a potentially stultifying high density. The way this could be orchestrated was to couple it with the efficiencies of modern approaches to manufacture and fabrication by employing the assembly line to house construction. This made it cost effective and lucrative for developers who could create large housing tracts and provide dwellings for an exploding population as the numbers of humans rose ever higher in the post-war period of calm and renewed prosperity created large demand for affordable housing in an attractive setting. And again, for many people who were making the transition from more rural environments to begin with and naturally appreciated a more gentle, user-friendly environment that was the promise of the suburban housing developments rather than the ubiquitous concrete and steel and asphalt surfaces of the modern city. This collaboration was successful in providing a kind of buffer zone that was a haven for a large population, enabling them to have a more natural environment, but still enjoy a feasible commute to the workplace and has been proven to have lasting value and continues to be in demand, particularly with the growing flight from urban centers because of the frequent violent demonstrations and uncertain safety with the civil unrest that is growing currently. And that's demonstrably true because uh, housing prices have, have gone up and sales are brisk right now in suburbia. Um, I, I know that to be a fact right now. And you would think that that would be, you know, with COVID and all the interesting problems we've had, that that might not be the case, but it's actually quite strong in the market right now. 
Well, the whole strategy of interlopers is to stir up trouble, to turn people against one another. And it works. There's a long history demonstrating that happens regularly. And when you have a real concentration of people, you, in effect, have either access to many potential friends or many potential enemies. <laughs> yeah. Or, or both by right, turns, yes. depending on the, you know, the drift of societal pressure and comings and goings of ideas and the political uh, uh, alliances and how things can be done to pressure humanity, like with a pandemic. So it brings out the best and the worst in people. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, want, I just want to say that that answer was surprising and delighting at the same time. I... Uh, I really appreciated that answer. Um, it was definitely, definitely an interesting insight for sure. U.S. creator, one of the big complaints of living in the suburbs is the mind-numbing sameness and lack of diversity in architecture. Built with economies of scale in mind and maximization of profits for the developers, simplicity of both design and materials was the rule. While this arguably made a modern lifestyle affordable for millions of people, it comes with a cost of existing in a kind of artificial conformity that seems less than truly divine. What is Creator's perspective on this cookie-cutter approach to everyday living? All right, and Creator tells us, as we indicated, the planning of a suburban housing tract is inherently a compromise in providing mass housing that is affordable to the masses while allowing the dwellings to be spread out enough to give people a sense of having their own little domain and relative privacy from the neighbors that is more difficult to achieve in high-rise buildings in the dense urban setting. This does not mean it is ideal. The ideal human lifestyle is living off of the land where people are dispersed as family units and extended family units living together but dispersed in a way that each has a large tract of land that can be used to cultivate crops and raise livestock to provide for their own food, so there is less need for outside goods and services. This lifestyle of self-containment and self-sufficiency is tried and true and has been done for many, many thousands of years by groups of people all over the world. Modern living is still an ongoing experiment and was inspired by the interlopers to draw people into dense urban centers for reasons of power and control, more so than for an actual benefit, let alone an improvement in the living environment per se. City living can be exciting, especially for the young. It provides opportunities to meet many others, for example. It provides a nexus of wage earners and thus will support a high density of goods and services being close at hand, particularly if most people rely on public transportation. There will need to be many shops, restaurants, and service centers of many kinds within walking distance. The large population also can support cultural institutions quite handily even if these must be subsidized to some extent through taxes. The population as a whole is sufficient to pay for such luxuries, so there can be a high quality of life from a variety of standpoints. This comes at a cost of being more disconnected from nature, which is a major liability. And it also reduces privacy and safety both, in terms of being around so many potential troublemakers who may use the anonymity of city living and its high density to great advantage in carrying out lives of crime. I get the impression that uh, Creator is not fond of, of cities <laughs> in the same way that he's, Creator is not fond of our medical system or our schools or many, many other things about modern life. Actually, cities are not a question of modern life, though. They, they go all the way back to uh, Sumer you know, thousands of years ago. But it's an interesting phenomenon, this packing of people in cities. Well, you know, Sumer was the um, sort of the initiation of extraterrestrial dominion. You know, that, yes. that was where the Anunnaki really held sway historically. And they were out in the open in those days. And rulers, because they were technologically advanced, they were imposing 
you know, 12 to 15 foot tall beings from the sky intimidated everything and everyone. And they were uh, a huge influence on society. So that has persisted, that, that perspective. And it turns out they want you where they can find you. Yes. They want you where they know where you are, where you're all clustered together so they can manipulate you en masse readily. And yeah, that makes mind control easier. It makes mind control easier and it makes extermination easier. <laughs> yeah. You know, if they want to create havoc, say with uh, a tornado or a hurricane, putting that in a path to come over a population center does a lot more damage. Oh, sure. Yeah. Than trying to cover a huge territory with people scattered, equidistant from one another. That is a logistical nightmare for warfare and so on. So I hate to be so dark about this, but that is the primary reason, and we know that to be true, for promoting cities. Yeah. It's to keep people in cages under observation. And and this is not a good thing. And I, I've watched this over the years, and the psychologists really promoting this life, the ecologists this is so much more friendly to the planet. You have a very small human footprint. You're not taking up that much land area. And you stack the people up in high rises. It's very efficient and it uses less energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Public transportation instead of everybody with their zillions of autos and so on. So those are all arguments for city concentration of the population and not a spreading out rurally. But there are trade-offs, and that's what oh, yeah. we're getting here, uh, getting at here with the questions and answers that are coming forth. And you asked this question of Creator Carl. One thing that strikes the observer is how unnatural the suburbs are. In the vast majority of suburban developments, the land is cleared of vegetation entirely. Every last tree, every last shrub, every last blade of grass is removed. In its place is the ubiquitous Kentucky bluegrass ornamental lawn and evergreen shrubbery. What is the spiritual impact of living every day in such an artificial environment? All right, and this is what Creator tells us. There is a spiritual impact from living in an unnatural setting. Humans were created to live within nature. This is an innate desire and a yearning of the heart. You are primed to desire and appreciate natural beauty and living things. To not have living things around you will create stress and a feeling of isolation. This observation is spot on in addressing a major deficiency of this lifestyle. There is no substitute for nature other than nature itself. Planting greenery that is unnatural acts more as a reminder of nature in providing some eye appeal than truly a nature setting that is deeply satisfying to the senses and sensibilities. Keep in mind that it is the city that is the most abnormal and unnatural of all. So suburbia is a compromise in between the urban and the rural that would be more ideal than a suburban housing development can emulate. But even in rural settings, there was a more savage destruction of forests and prairies than was necessarily needed to provide living space for a growing population. There were certainly few greatly concerned about conservation other than having small city and village parks to provide some space for children to play, not truly as a nature preserve that could emulate deep natural areas of plant life. This denuding of things is actually quite sinister. It is a manipulation applied again and again and again whenever there is something under construction and plans need to be drawn up. There are some independent contractors, often working for individuals in possession of land that might be handed down from one generation to the next, who will go over the plans with a keen eye to preserving as much of the native foliage, especially trees, as possible to create a new dwelling but within a more natural setting. Not only are such homes highly prized, it is amazing this is not a universal expectation and demand 
that is seen to by developers to do more landscaping and even preparation of tracts of land done well in advance of the housing developments themselves to get trees in place so there'll be growth of size dispersed among the individual plots of land. We understand that takes money as well as coordinated efforts. The reason it is not done is more that it is discouraged and such thinking blocked by the interlopers who want humans to be living in abject conditions to the extent it can be arranged readily. And that is why there are so many impoverished nations still. It is why people live in harsh lands with visibly low prospects for abundant food and water. But this continues generation after generation. They are living, in effect, as slaves, unable to break free. Even though they are not contained by visible barriers, they are nonetheless chained to those harsh lands and are hemmed in by neighbors not wanting them in any event. That, too, is an orchestration. So this is a dilemma that is self-perpetuating, but at the behest of the interlopers controlling things behind the scenes. So even in affluent countries, every effort is made to diminish the quality of life, even when affluent areas are under development. The fact some wealthy neighborhoods end up being beautiful is a testament to the wealth of the homeowners themselves, not planners, not the government officials overseeing those areas. It is the appreciation of the individual citizens in having a well-constructed, attractive home, architecturally speaking, as well as many delightful touches with the planting of trees and shrubs and often ornamental gardens that make some neighborhoods appear to be like a paradise. As always, nature will cooperate, given half a chance, but there must be the will of the people themselves to value the enriched atmosphere that architectural landscaping can bring. You know, I'm reminded of the song, uh, where they pave paradise and put in a parking lot. Remember that one, Carl? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, there have been, you know, kind of cultural milestones through the arts all along the way in my life thinking about this you know the there was a song back in the 50s about the ticky tacky homes and this sort of thing and uh that comes to mind so we're aware of this we see it we feel it oh yeah you know i, I remember when there was the big uh, advent of silk plants <laughs> you could buy artificial plants that actually look real and so people would embrace them and put them around their homes and and indoors which you know it's a practical uh, adjunct yeah they never fade you don't have to water them <laughs> right but it but it speaks to that inner yearning that yes. it really is what makes us human to feel close to the land and close to nature and it's a beautiful thing and it's a divine impulse Absolutely. Well, you know, we have a yearning for more of this, but we'll have to get past these commercials coming right up next. Welcome back to Second Spectrum to Give Wisdom. We are talking about life in suburbia, uh, looking at some of the hidden factors about how it came about and about its ongoing influence, uh, the good things about it, and maybe some of the things that aren't so good about it. But it's definitely an interesting topic. Well, let's uh, let's launch in and look a little deeper at, at some of the th- curiosities that this has spawned culturally and physically in coping with trying to live in a non-ideal environment, you know, with work demands and considerations and so on. We, we can't all have our individual Shangri-La, you know, out in the wilderness with a natural setting. You know, it takes money to be able to be independent and off the grid, so to speak. Yes, Absolutely. Or our own private island, but that's another topic. (laughs) You asked, creator, and what about those lawns? We learned that plants do experience fear. That suggests that lawns represent a great deal of regularly scheduled trauma for the mowed grass surrounding almost every suburban home. Does this have any discernible effect on the humans who live in the midst of this regularly scheduled carnage? (laughs) Well, that may be surprising, to people. This is an old idea that's been looked at even scientifically. And this is what Creator tells us. It is actually the case that plants have feelings and suffer not only discomfort but great fear when threatened. There is a primitive consciousness that favors survival. So they will know when they are under threat and when they have been injured will feel it and respond in kind. 
and this will affect the consciousness of the grass itself when it knows it is under siege again and again and again and loses half of its being or more with all that trimming. There is more to the story and how it came to be the grass was such a fixture in dressing up properties. It is a simple and low-cost solution and has a long-standing tradition in the old country where large lawns were planted and maintained as a kind of safety buffer zone around royal dwellings and castles. It was easiest to keep the land relatively free of tall foliage by such plantings, and this provided good visibility so marauders could not approach without being seen. This also has visual appeal in its own right, but the clean, fresh appearance of a sea of green flowing, growing happily in the sun. Although of the sameness, it has a natural beauty of its own. This is in contrast to the many ugly plants considered to be weeds that are often more aggressive and will tend to overtake other plants and choke them out. And then there will be a field of relative ugliness that may even have a large percentage of thorns and thistles that render the land unusable and without a visual appeal at all. Such plants are not native to the earth and are not part of creator's plans, but were introduced by the interlopers. So this was another level of safety by the imposition of plots of grass. It is a way to dress up a property and exclude the ugliness of the interlopers, if only as an icon of their depredation of the earth and its inhabitants by fighting back weeds and maintaining attractive plantings to be the dominant species on display. In many ways, the earth has been spoiled and cannot go back to a natural balance because there are too many unnatural species that are abundant. So having lawns is a kind of coping strategy that provides the appearance of natural beauty, even though it might not be truly natural, and having such large tracts of uniformity with a single species of plant. Wow, this was a, you know, it always surprises me, you know, how how much information creator packs into an answer sometimes. And uh, there's a lot of insight in this one, especially, you know, the little lesson on how the you know, castle owners used it for protection. That was that was something I never really thought about. Well, the whole idea that the pests in our midst, the invasive species, the things that sting, that bite, that hurt, that that can kill, or are just uh, a nuisance and and a real nasty nuisance. Things people are terribly allergic to. And all these plants with thorns and prickers and so on, you can justify it if it's something like a rose where you've got some beauty. But but most of the weeds are just awfully ugly. Oh, yeah. They're a scourge. And some of them are highly aggressive, like kudzu. Yes. It can take over the landscape. And, And you think about it from that perspective, acres and acres of grass actually makes sense. You know, it keeps, yes. keeps all that at bay. So, but I, mean, I haven't really it, thought about that either, to be honest with you. These well, are, and it's part of a larger theme here that we're living in an imperfect world because interlopers have made it so. Right. When I first started channeling, I would get these messages that the earth was created to be a loving nest for human. And you can look around and say, well, you know, why is most of the water salt water? And why... Why are we fighting with all these predatory species and we've got all these infectious organisms? I mean, I'm just a homeowner with a small plot, but I get fungal infections on four or five different plants and trees that I have on my little plot here. You know, what's with that? I don't want to use chemicals, but I don't want to see all the leaves fall off and the plants die. Right, right. And and it it isn't natural. God didn't create those things to be here. They're from another world of predatory ideologies and evil. And it doesn't mix with our gentle sensibilities and our appreciation for beauty. No, it does not. You ask, Creator, most indigenous peoples around the globe built simple dwellings that were more circular and curvy rather than squares and rectangles and hard corners. 
There is some belief that squared rooms and hard corners have deleterious and undesirable effects on the energy of the dwelling, that due to the harsh effect of hard 90-degree corners, energy cannot flow as it should and becomes perturbed in ways that can actually be harmful to humans over time. Is this true? And if so, is the widespread use of straight lines and hard corners in modern construction a result of interloper manipulation? All right, and Creator tells us the following. There are differences in the energetics of enclosed spaces that are angular versus circular. These are not major considerations with respect to health, for example, but are more important aesthetically. This is not to say they are trivial and meaningless, but to the eye of the artist, which might be rare and little shared as a perspective, all human beings to some degree can appreciate beauty. They might react in differing ways, but will be perceiving it nonetheless. Round spaces have great visual appeal. They are intriguing to the eye. They have a more natural feel because there are not such angular spaces in nature. So it is unnatural to live within a cube, for example. And that is a reminder in and of itself that one is in an artificial space. To the extent they can be decorated, they can be uplifting and even perceived as spectacular. But usually that requires, what that requires is some kind of opening or a series of openings where one can look beyond the dwelling itself and perhaps see the heavens through a series of skylights or have a view of the outdoors, as in backing up to a forested area and feeling like one is within it, at least on one side of the building. Such properties are always perceived as high value for these reasons when there is a view, a view of water being in very high demand universally. This is the inherent appreciation of natural beauty that humans love and will cherish as a blessing. A rounded dwelling is a great reminder of beauty and a natural feel. It is true, of course, that anything that can be degraded in some way and rendered ineffectual in enjoying a good reception, and to be sure there are practical issues with curved spaces, particularly with regard to economy of scale and the demands for good engineering and use of materials to meet the particular needs of such designs, But this is a practical consideration only, not what is most desirable or would be preferred, all other things being equal. To some degree, of course, there are cultural norms and conditioning through life experience to be comfortable with what one is used to and to seek something similar, where a large departure in design would strike many as being radical and a kind of disconnection from their roots, so to speak, But that is simply a testament to human adaptability and ingenuity that you can make the best of a bad circumstance and eventually call it home and it will feel like home in the end. That is a strength rather than a weakness. So this this answer was actually um, one that I really appreciate because I had encountered this notion of, you know, straight lines and angles perturbing energy some sometime back in my research years ago. It always kind of just floated in the back of my mind as, you know, just one more thing that is making life, you know, challenging for all of us. So it's a little bit uh, refreshing and um, relieving, I should say, to have Creator come out and say, no, it's not really that big of a problem. So I'm <laughs> glad to hear that. Well, it's it's an aesthetic consideration. But, you know, we all have the limits, you know, financial primarily, and then everything flows from that and what we can afford to do in creating a nice lifestyle for ourselves. I've always dreamed of having a geodesic dome. I like that. I like large volume space. And, you know, so that has its own costs and practical issues. And, of course, you're going to run into the government. Yep. It won't fit in with most zoning laws and so on. So there's a... Enforced conform, uh, uh, conformity in uh, the way people live. And we're going to talk about that now in more detail. You ask creator, well, there are more similarities and differences in suburban communities. Some subdivisions take conformity to an almost absurd level. The HOA or Homeowners Association, while like many things had an arguably benign beginning, has for some communities become something akin to Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia. Everything from not mowing your lawn on time to having the wrong flower arrangement on your porch 
to even fly in the American flag can truly bring shocking levels of backlash. How did this come about, and how did karma play a role in luring some hapless homeowners into these truly American dream nightmares? All right, and Creator tells us the following. What you are seeing quite starkly in these situations is the difficulty people have in getting along because of the corrupting influence of the interlopers. People are manipulated to create differences of opinion and strong reactions to them, even to the extent people will shun others who do not think like they do or even attack them, and sometimes violently. This is wholly unnatural, but when humans are being so heavily manipulated with mind control to create warring factions and harbor grievances, resentments, and grudges against others they dislike, this creates many ongoing tensions that will likely erupt given half a chance with some kind of small disagreement that can escalate and lead to violence at the extreme. There are significant numbers of human beings who are manipulated because of their karmic history and predisposing personality characteristics to be troublemakers and worse. When you have a community of any size, the likelihood of having one or more of such individuals in your midst becomes close to certain. This is the true reason that homeowners associations sometimes feel compelled to develop an almost Nazi-like power and control. It is because those few troublemakers will push the limits to such an extent, if not hard-nosed in controlling everyone without exception and making everyone follow strict rules, there will be great disruptive influences from the few but the many will suffer. So the heavy-handed actions of the homeowner association bylaws and their governance are a kind of self-defense against being harmed by people with extreme views who will go out of their way to overstep boundaries and take advantage of their neighbors unless there is a strict oversight and enforcement backed up with some system of punishment. While the latter is truly a lowering of standards and quality of life, it is often the lesser of evils than to have a few troublemakers become major predators who cannot be successfully opposed by individuals taking them on one at a time when they cross paths. So aggregating the power of the group within a body charged with the oversight of rules will enable keeping such individuals in check For the most part, it is the interlopers who have created the need for such things. You are not living on the earth as free divine humans. You are living in a kind of prison compound with great corruption in your midst. You know, this answer surprised me, but thinking about it, boy, does it make sense you know, we all have experience of, of difficult neighbors somewhere in our past, more than likely. And, um, you know, it really does just take a few bad apples to ruin the whole lot. Well, stories like this are legion. And it's the the theme often of sitcoms and, and various uh, cinematic uh, accountings of people and their lives. And there's people in varying degrees of extremeness in their conduct and their morality and how they act on that. Some are just loud and aggressive, but they're mostly bark and not bite. But there are others who can turn to violence. And so you'll see a litany of these things going back through records. You know, a neighbor killing their neighbor because there is some dispute about a fence that wasn't put in the right spot or there was something not being maintained and someone took a fence and somebody's dog got in their yard and then it ends up somebody's dead. You know, these these are sometimes relatively ordinary because anybody can have an emotional difficulty. But there's about 1% of the population who are heavily corrupted to be active troublemakers. Yes, And the world doesn't know this, but this is true. 
And so this is the kind of thing creators alluding to in the answer to this particular question. If you've got one of these in your homeowners group, look out below because there's going to be no end of trouble. Yeah. You know, I'm reminded of the time I was living in college and uh, I had bought a station wagon off of a friend just because he was he needed some money. And so I was going to turn around and resell it. And I brought it home and. You know, it wasn't the greatest looking vehicle. It wasn't the worst looking vehicle. And it was in a drive when I took a license plate off of it because it was just temporary. I wasn't, I didn't own the vehicle. I had a cop showing up one hour later and writing me a ticket for an abandoned vehicle. Somebody reported it mm -hmm. one hour after it was sitting there. Unbelievable. Yeah. But this is what you're talking about. Well, you know, and it gets worse than just the busybody. I have a client who has a neighbor who is one of these individuals, and she's constantly menaced and threatened. She finds nails on her driveway, broken, broken glass on her driveway, racial slurs painted on her garage door, on her side of the garage door. <laughs> and her mailbox has been tampered with and and destroyed functionally so she can't open it and she's responsible for having to pay for it every time they have to put a new mailbox in yeah. because this is considered the owner's inappropriate use and abuse of the right. common property so you know the, these people are out there and they're a fixture and this is one of the reasons we have these big demonstrations that go south that go bad that turn violent the troublemakers show up because this is a perfect opportunity for them yes. to, to vent all the anger that's being stirred up in them. Well, unfortunately, we have a troublemaker that is showing up right now. It's called having to stop for a break. So we'll be right back with more Get Wisdom right after this. Welcome back to the final segment of this week's Get Wisdom. We are talking about creator's perspective of life in suburbia. And uh, it's interesting. It's a complex mix of interloper manipulations, but also some divine inspiration. So it's really a hybrid, Carl. Well, I think the thing to keep in mind, we keep harping on these dark undercurrents and developments, but those are the things that are non-obvious. And that is our role, after all, to bring out hidden truth. We know what's on the surface. We may not understand it fully, but there are deeper reasons for things. And it's important to understand what those are. Because otherwise, there's no hope. We can never grow. We can never improve on things if we don't understand what we're up against. So that's the spirit of this. And the one thing that runs through the whole thread here today is that we have divine support all the way along. Yes. And it only comes in response to requests from humans. So there's enough to kind of keep us limping along. But we can do much better if we're more active at it. So this is intended to be kind of maybe a kick in the rear a little bit, but a wake-up call to yeah. get people to think more deeply about consequences. And one of the issues we are always facing is the complacency. Yes. And absolutely. you know, the sometimes despair in people feeling yeah. they're powerless. You're not powerless because you have God on your side, but you and have to ask that divine help yes and what we're, what we're also trying to do in this project is is help inculcate people's faith and asking a lot of these questions and seeing the hand of the divine and something is that we take for granted like the suburbs i mean really can help bolster the outlook that god exists and that there is intervention in our behalf that there's a loving god that is actively working on our behalf but there's also problems there's there's problems that we're not aware of the interlopers and all of that as well so this is an interesting survey mm -hmm. you asked creator the typical suburban home is actually built for a nuclear family with at least two or more children yet we see some mcmansions with thousands of square feet of living space and five bedrooms and bathrooms being owned and lived in by childless couples at some level this seems a bit insane yet it is almost becoming the norm now the defense is that the home is not just a dwelling, but an investment. Contrast all these underutilized investments with the growing and overwhelming homeless problem in this country. And one standing back from it all has to think, there must be a better way. What is Creator's perspective on all of this? 
right? And these are creator's words. When you compare and contrast lifestyles and living arrangements and the examples of the haves versus the have-nots in your world, it is all too often the case people view it simplistically as some people being privileged while others are disadvantaged, that some people who are better off somehow have taken advantage and have an unfair head start or are given special privileges denied to others, so their wealth and seeming extravagance is perceived as unfair and maybe undeserved, and is often used as a political lever to rouse masses of people to follow a political agenda promising greater equality and a redistribution of wealth. Such ideas inevitably have ended up in requiring enforcement through force of arms. Here again is further evidence of great imbalance in the culture and in human interrelationships at all levels. This is seen to because you are so heavily influenced by evil overseers who set up hierarchical systems of governance and workplace environments that are inhuman in many basic respects and will create many inequities, many types of unfairness. And those distortions will often become magnified over time. All nations with class distinctions in their population are products of this kind of manipulation. And the damage is apparent in the creation of tension and resentments as so many become excluded from having a place at the table, so to speak, in sharing the bounty that comes from a smooth running nation state that has developed a degree of advanced technological capability for manufactured goods and services. In a loving world, that would simply ensure there would be abundance enough for all. But yet this has resulted in the same old hierarchy of inequities where power and control and their profits go to the top of the hierarchy. And those making the contributions through their own efforts and inconvenience oftentimes are poorly rewarded. If things are uneven and unequal, It will make it more likely that everything about the lives of those individuals will be wanting in some respect. What they have in the way of personal possessions and their living environment especially will be limited and will be shabby in some respects, will be second rate and unsatisfying to some degree. Poverty flows from a poverty of ideas as much as anything else. Given the intelligence of the human species and the creative potential to apply ingenuity for problem solving, it is not that you lack genius, it is that you lack freedom. Humanity is greatly constrained when it is the hierarchy that is rewarded rather than achievement, things will get out of balance. Power, control, and profits flow to the top then without an equal sharing of rewards commensurate with contributions. This is simply the persistence of the idea of slaves and slave masters, such that even when slavery is outlawed, people still live as slaves, albeit with some greater mobility to move from job to job, but they will always remain underlings to the powers that be. That will not change because your overseers do not want it to. This will only change with divine help. You know, there's a great bumper sticker in this channeling, Carl. I love this line. It is not that you lack genius. It is that you lack freedom. I think that will look good on a lot of vehicles. (laughs) Yeah. Well, as long as people get the enlightenment to know its true meaning. Yes. Yes. This this is what's missing. We're largely still in ignorance as as a world population. Yes, and uh, we're here to try to try to do what, our little bit to change that as much as we can. You ask Creator, can Creator share how prayer work and the light worker healing protocol can help us create a better and more balanced collective future for all that preserves some of the benefits of suburban living while mitigating and even eliminating most of its adverse effects? Creator says, in a world of great inequality, There are many things that need to change in fundamental ways. That is always the hardest to achieve. 
in throwing off a bad practice with evil origin that has become a cultural norm and rewards a certain class of individuals at the expense of others, there will be powerful resistance to change such an idea because those with power are the beneficiaries. There needs to be an opening of minds and hearts to feel a kind of empathy for those who suffer from the inequities inherent in this system. Only an act of compassion through a higher awareness will allow any kind of change to occur. In a normal world, that would happen through the inherent goodness and spiritual alignment of the majority of humans in residence. But the world is heavily corrupted through ongoing manipulation, power, and control by the interlopers who have corrupted your government and your institutions to keep humans suppressed in their thinking and complacent and insensitive to the suffering of others. As long as people have a bare minimum, they are accustomed to expecting little more. That is not a prescription for throwing off the chains of oppression or a true renaissance and an awakening that greater possibilities can be brought into existence through an upswelling of desire. With the creation of fertile environments for creative change and bold innovative thinking to try new strategies and allowing a wholesale change in the organization and objectives of Earth's institutions to break with hidebound tradition and create new paradigms and reward systems to encourage creativity and imagination to raise everything up to new heights. That could be done within a generation in the absence of outside manipulation. So how will that happen when you are not in control to begin with? You cannot vote in a new government and have the expectation anything will change for the better. It will change the names and faces, but the same games will continue. The same tried and true diversions and manipulations and unfair practices. You need divine help to break out of your cages and create a new world from top to bottom, built on freedom and true equality and fairness. This will require a sea change in human thinking and perspectives because you have been subjugated for so long and have been rendered complacent in having low expectations for human betterment. The divine help you can access fully up to the challenge here to right the wrongs of the past and transform things into a vastly greater existence. That cannot happen until the problem of evil is solved. It is standing squarely in your path and it controls you. That can only be eased through divine intervention to bring healing of sufficient magnitude for those who oppress you, that there can be enough of a shift in their intentions to allow something better to begin happening. The first order of business is to achieve a withdrawal of the dark extraterrestrials from your realm and then removal through a healing enterprise to engage with and raise up the dark spirit influence that has corrupted everything. When this has successfully enabled the divine outreach to start them on a better path, then humanity at long last will have enough freedom in the range of possibilities that healing can begin in earnest for the tremendous backlog of karmic wounding that has accumulated through the ages of continued oppression. You have existed more as slaves than as free human beings. That can all change if you choose for it to happen and take action. It will only happen at your direct request. We are waiting to see what you choose and whether you can do your part and live up to the promise inherent in your creation to be change agents in solving the problem of evil. That will benefit the entire universe and change the destiny of everyone and everything within it. You know, I think it's, it's really amazing because Creator has said this many, many times throughout many channelings, is that we can change things within a generation or two, you know, which is maybe 40 years, if we just get this yoke of evil off of our backs, you know, and uh, just wanted to reemphasize that here, that, there's, you know, it's getting rid of this problem 
that uh, will open things up tremendously. And it's a light worker heating protocol that is the means to do that, Carl. Yes, that's why it's been given to us through divine grace, through our learning and our scholarship as the answer. We need high-level help. We need high-level requests of what is needed because otherwise a weak, incomplete prayer with lack of awareness won't get you very far. You need to learn how to pray better and how to heal better and request it. Yes, That's and you what can we requ- offer at Get Wisdom. Absolutely, and you can learn more about Lightworker Healing Protocol at GetWisdom.com slash LHP. GetWisdom.com slash LST. That is a link to downloading an ebook that explains the Lightworker Healing Protocol and Lightworker Healing Protocol training. That's a mouthful uh, that you can get at GetWisdom.com. Carl, we are all out of time for this episode, as usual, and we'll see you all next week. All right, be well. <laughs> 